Hi, welcome to part B of the mechanics section of the syllabus. I won't waste any of your time, I'll let you just get straight to the questions. So the next part of the syllabus referred to friction, air resistance and terminal velocity. And I don't know how else I would talk about this question without talking about a parachutist jumping from an airplane. It is always a parachute is jumping from an airplane, is it not? Um, so this question says that a parachute just jumps out of a plane at height h. She is subject to air resistance with a force of minus alpha v squared. And the equation of her motion is given by this um, differential equation here. So they're asking, what are the units of alpha? Uh, they are asking us to calculate the terminal velocity of the parachutist, and they want us to estimate how much work is done by the air resistance. So this is essentially three questions in one. So I've split it into an A, B, and a C, just to not complicate things as much. Now, they've already told us that uh, minus alpha V squared is a force, so we need to know that it has the units of a force. Uh, but also just unit matching for this equation here. We can see this is a force, this is a force. Um, and in order to get this force on the left here, we need to have a force minus a force. Um, and our SI units of a force are kg ms, minus uh, ms to the power of minus two. Uh, and you can get that from uh, it being mass times acceleration, right? So we can say that kg ms minus two is equal to the units of alpha multiplied by the units that we already know, which are the units of speed squared. So if we square these, we get m squared s minus two. Uh, we can cancel this s minus two on the other side, and then we can move this m squared uh, underneath or divide both sides by m squared um, to get kg m over m squared. So that means that the units of alpha will be kg uh, divided by m. Okay, next, our part b, it wants us to find the terminal velocity. And the terminal velocity happens when we are no longer accelerating. So that means our acceleration, or dv by dt, our rate of change of velocity, is zero. So if we stick that in, we say zero is mg uh, minus alpha v squared. And then we can just rearrange this expression for the velocity. And that is our terminal velocity. OK, and then this last part I call part C. And it wants us to estimate um, the work done. And the easiest way to do this is to look at how much energy we had at the beginning and compare it to how much energy we have at the end. So uh, at the beginning, so at the top, we have this potential gravitational potential energy described by mgh okay so at the ground she will have um this work that she's done against the air resistance but she'll also hit the ground with some velocity so she'll also have a kinetic energy so we can equate these two we can say that mgh is equal to half mv squared plus work and we know um, that she's traveling near terminal velocity, so we can use this terminal velocity here. Uh, and then rearrange for our work, and we get this expression, and that is it. Okay, so this question is about levers, uh, pulleys, and machines. Um, so this example here has uh, two mass, have two masses that are connected by a string, which is non-extensible, so it means it does not possess any elastic potential energy. Uh, and assuming that there is no friction, we need to derive uh, an expression for the acceleration of the masses and for the tension in the spring. So of course, the place to start with anything like this would be uh, Newton's second law. So if we look at this kind of micro system down here, I suppose, um, or the system of M2, uh, if we use Newton's second law on this, we would say that mass two multiplied by its acceleration is equal to uh, this weight force minus this tension. And we know because uh, these two masses are attached by an inextensible spring, uh, string, then um, they need to have the same acceleration. So if we look at this second system up here, 
uh, we can do Newton's second law on that as well. So we can say that mass one times the acceleration, which is the same as the previous acceleration, is equal to the tension. Uh, and then if we rearrange this for tension, we can pop this tension in here. And we end up with an equation that we can rearrange for the acceleration. And then we can use this acceleration back in here to get an expression for tension. Okay, for the rest of this question, then we need to consider friction. So it has a frictional coefficient of mu s when it's stationary and mu d when it's moving. So we need to derive expressions for the accelerations, for the masses, and for the tensions again, um, but this time taking into account friction. And we need to come up with a condition um, that we need to satisfy in order for it to accelerate. So our um, two frictional forces they've told us here are when it's static, so when it's still, then our friction is mu s um, m1g. And then when it's dynamic, the friction is mu d m1g. And we know it's m1 because the friction is acting on mass one. So we can come up with two equations here. We have this equation from looking at mass one. So doing Newton's second law on mass one, again, it's the same as before, except we also have to take into account this uh, frictional value. And then this second equation, the Newton's second law uh, for the second mass is the same as it was in the previous part. Um, so we can rearrange this for tension. And then we can pop that back into our first equation. Uh, and rearrange that to get a value for our acceleration by there. And then we can use that value of acceleration to go back in here to get a value for our tension. Okay, and then to accelerate, so if we look at the at mass two, then we need our weight to be greater than our tension in order to pull it downwards. Um, and then if we look at the other mass, then we need our tension to be greater than our friction. So we can come up with this here, but the T is kind of irrelevant here. Um, so we can just say that mu S M1G needs to be less than M2G uh, and then take out the Gs and we have mu S M1 needs to be less than M2. And that gives us kind of an easy expression um, for our a condition on the friction essentially. So we need our static friction to be less than M2 over M1. Okay, so the table on which the mass M1 is resting is now rotating. So this is pulling back to our um, circular motion like we had in the previous, in one of the previous questions. Um, so assuming that the object with uh, mass M1 can be treated as point-like, derive an expression for the minimal and maximal distance between M1 and the axis of rotation. So what's happening here is that we are kind of rotating around this pulley now. So we're kind of going around like this. Uh, so if we look at that from a uh, top view, we have this string attached to this mass and that's the pulley here uh, and this is the table and the table is rotating around like this so we have the mass hanging down um, but that's into the page <laughs> so we shouldn't really be able to see that and then this table is rotating around at angular velocity omega so this means that we have some kind of a centripetal force outwards and we still have our tension inwards and we have our friction as well um, but depending on uh, the relative sizes of T and um, CP between our tension and our centripetal force, our mass might be moving inwards or it might be moving outwards. Um, so this is where the maximum and the minimum come from. Uh, and depending on whether our mass is moving inwards or outwards uh, would depend on, it uh, would alter the direction of the friction as well. So we can still look at Newton's second law for this part here as normal. So we can say that our mass times acceleration is M2G minus T, but uh, we are kind of looking on the onset of movement. So we can say that the acceleration is zero at, the, at that point. 
So we can say that our tension is M2G. Um, and now, if we look at the circular motion forces, so we have um, this M1 omega squared R, which is our central petal force. Um, and then we also have our tension, and then we have this friction that changes direction, whether it's on the verge of moving outward or on the verge of moving inwards. Um, so we can just rearrange these uh, to get our max as M2G plus M1G mu S over M1 mix squared, and then the smaller one has its minus in it. Um, so perhaps an easier um idea of how I ended up with these equations to look like this is if we think back to this um diagram here what we have are we have a mass times acceleration so if we look at this first diagram and then we do a Newton second law we can say that mass one times acceleration is equal to the sum of forces so if we say that positive is going inwards then t would be positive um, the centripetal force would be negative, and then depending on whether we're moving in or out, the uh, static friction um, will the static friction will be either positive or negative. And then on the onset of motion, our acceleration is zero, so we can move uh, f centripetal to the other side to be positive is equal to t plus or minus f. Uh, friction but remembering it's static friction and that is how we end up with these equations down here okay next is uh so the next topic we're going to be describing it are springs hooke's law and potential energy uh, so this question is an example of an archer drawing uh, the string of her bow to fire an arrow uh, so we've given some we've been given some information on the uh, mass of the arrow, um, the force in the string, etc. And here we want to use uh, the conservation of energy to work out uh, at what velocity the um, arrow will impart. So if we imagine that all of this elastic, elastic, all of this elastic potential energy is converted to um, kinetic energy then we have two equations for elastic potential energy. We have half kx squared, but we also have half fx. Um, so using half fx, because uh, this is to do with the values that we actually have, uh, we end up with 36 joules as our um, elastic potential energy. And then our kinetic energy is half mv squared. Uh, so we can equate that if we imagine that all of the energy was converted to kinetic energy. Uh, and then rearrange for our V to get 60 meters per second. So next we're saying that only a fraction of this energy was actually converted to uh, kinetic energy. So we do the same thing again, except this time we have to uh, multiply this 36 joules by the fraction uh, of energy that we've actually received. Uh, as you can see, I've done that here and we get 50 meters per second. Okay, so the archer aims at a target which is 50 meters away, uh, and we want to know how long will it take for the arrow to reach the target. So this is a CVAT question. Um, we know we're traveling at 50 meters per second, and it's 50 meters away, so that would imply that it takes one second. You could use CVATs, or you can just use the definition of velocity for this. Um, and then to account for the effects of gravity, estimate how far above the center of the target the archer must aim to ensure that the arrow strikes the middle. So for this, I did use Suvat. Um, so we want to know how much it will drop, essentially, as it flies through the air. So it has an initial vertical velocity of zero. Um, and then taking into account our gravity or our acceleration due to gravity, uh, we can use s equals ut plus half a t squared to come up with this displacement of five. So if it's going to drop five um, in the air, then we need to aim five meters above. It seems like quite a lot. <laughs> um, and then if the arrow is brought to rest in a distance of five millimeters, what is the average force of the arrow strike? So here um, 
we are using um, principles of conservation of energy again. And essentially what we're saying is in order to um, cancel out this kinetic energy to bring this thing to rest, we need to um, do some work on it to slow it down, to stop it. So the work done will be force times distance. And we know that it travels five millimeters. Uh, and we need to convert all of the kinetic energy that we had into work. So the first thing that we need to do is because we have this horizontal um, velocity component and a vertical velocity component, we need to find a uh, resultant velocity that it will hit this um, board with. And that comes out to 10 root 26 uh, using Pythagoras, essentially, um, what we talked about in the first section. So then from that, we can work out what the kinetic energy it hits the board with is. So half mv squared, and we know the mass of the arrow. Uh, so it has 26 joules as it hits the board. And then finally, we can say that uh, our work done is 26 joules. Um, and our work done is force times distance. And we know our distance, so we can rearrange this to get 5,200 newtons. And then finally, if the target has a mass of five kilograms, at what velocity is it thrown back by the arrow strike? So for this, we're going to be using the conservation of momentum. This is very simple. Um, we essentially say that the arrow strikes the board with some momentum, and then that momentum needs to be conserved. So if we say mass arrow times velocity arrow plus mass board plus um for mass board multiplied by the velocity of the board in the beginning is equal to all of that at the end. So in the beginning, we have uh, the mass of the arrow is 20 grams times the velocity of the arrow, which we worked out in the previous question to be 10 at root 26, plus the mass of the board, which is um, five kilograms times the velocity of the board while it's initially still, so that'll be zero, is equal to the mass of the arrow, so 20 times 10 to the minus three, times the velocity of the arrow at the end, which is zero because it's slowed down to a halt, plus the mass of the board, which is five kilograms multiplied by the velocity of the board. So we can cancel the things at the zero and rearrange to get that velocity to be 0 0.2 meters per second. Okay, so next we have a question that um, relates masses on springs. Um, I thought this is a useful question because it's a question where you can neglect irrelevant information that they give you. Um, and also, I think it's just useful to remember um, how stiffness is added in series and in parallel uh, for springs. So we're given this kind of reference spring, if you will, and we're told that it has a period of T and we want to work out what the periods of the other springs are, uh, knowing that these are kind of the replicas of the springs of that initial spring added in uh, series and in parallel. So um, the way that stiffness is added, it's, I find it uh, quite, uh, I think it's easier to think of how stiffness is added in an intuitive way. So if you have two springs that are next to each other and you try and pull against them, it's going to be pretty hard to move them because you have two lots of stiffnesses kind of acting against you. So you're going to have double the stiffness for this one. Um, however, if you have one long line of spring, it'll be easier to pull it apart um, because for the amount of force that you put on here, you end up with kind of double uh, the change in length. So for this, for some force you add here, you get half of the change in length uh, that you would for this. And then for this, as you put the same force on it, you would get double the change in length that you would for this. So if it requires more force to move it a little bit, then it would make it more stiff. And then if it requires less force to move it a certain distance, then it would be less stiff. So our stiffness of our first one is K, our stiffness of our second one is K over two, and our stiffness of our third one is 2K 
And we should be able to recall that our period is equal to 2 pi root m over k, or 2 pi root mock, if you prefer. So uh, from this equation, so in this question, they told us that gravity is 2g. But gravity is not related to this equation at all, which implies that it's just not related to the question. So we can ignore the fact that gravity is 2g. Then we can stick in our new k values. And we can say that 2 pi root m over k times 1 over 1 over root 2 is root 2t. And then in a similar fashion here, we have 2 pi root m over k times 1 over root 2 is 1 over root 2t. Because this is the same as t up here and this is the same as t up here. Okay, so this next topic relates to energy and power. And it says that an ice cube slides down a frictionless slope, which is at an angle alpha to the horizontal. The slope sits on a horizontal table of height h above the ground. If the ice cube is released from rest at height h above the ground, what is the speed uh, of the cube when it is halfway down the slope? So here's just a little diagram. What is that so weird? So here's a diagram of what is happening. Uh, we have this total height h, capital H rather, and then we have the height of the table little h. So the height of the top of our slope from the top of the table, I've called h1, and then halfway down, I've called h2. Um, and using similar triangles, we can say that h1 is double h2. And h1 is equal to capital H minus little h. Oh my gosh, I've done all these wrong around, haven't I? So yeah, using similar triangles, we can say that h2 is half of h1. And the energy at the top uh, is all gravitational potential energy because we're still. And then our energy halfway would be some gravitational energy plus some kinetic energy. Um, but we know that the gravitational potential energy is half because it's halfway down. Uh, so we can stick in our values for our heights. Um, so mgh minus h here, and then mgh minus h over 2 plus half mv squared. And then we can equate these two um, from the principle of conservation of energy uh, and rearrange to get an expression for our velocity halfway down. Now, this second question, I wasn't really sure whether I should put this under the pulleys portion or under this power and energy portion, but I think it fits better in the power and energy, and you'll see why as we go through. So here we have a pulley um, attached to this motor, and this motor is essentially spinning this little circle around to draw in this string and then lift this mass up. Uh, and the first thing that we want to know is knowing all of these values here, uh, what is the current driving the motor? So first of all, we want to know how much power it requires to lift this mass. Um, and power is uh, the rate of change of energy, essentially. Um, so we can say that uh, the energy required is mgh. Uh, so we require gravitational potential energy. So what we're essentially doing is we're converting this kind of electrical energy into gravitational potential energy to lift this mass here. So we can say that our power to lift the mass is mgh over time. And uh, another way of saying h over time is distance over time. So distance it travels up um, over the time it takes, which is the speed that it's traveling up. And we've been told that the speed that it's traveling up is u, which is 0.5. So we can stick in these values, the mass is 100, uh, gravity, uh, acceleration due to gravity is, we're allowed to assume it's 10, um, and then our U is 0 0.5, so it will take 500 watts to lift this thing. And then another equation uh, relating power and voltage is P equals IV, 
So we know the voltage um, of this motor here is 230 volts. Uh, and we know that the power it needs to generate is 500 watts. So in order to work out the current, we can use P equals IV. So we can say that IV is 500 and then rearrange this in order to get the current. Okay, so the next question is asking what the angular velocity of the motor's winding reel is. So we need to know that V equals omega R. So our angular velocity um, is related to our velocity, our um, linear velocity in this way. And we know um, the diameter of this little thing here. Um, so we can also know the radius. So we can say that V is omega d of two. Um, but we need to know what the velocity at this point here is. And at this point, it would be very tempting to just say it's U. But we need to remember that we're working with a pulley here. And what's happening with a pulley is um, as we're traveling upwards like this at this velocity U, these strings are each lifting at this velocity here. But this string here is a collaboration of all three of these like sections of the string, essentially. So the velocity of this portion here is going to be different to the velocity of these portions here. It's actually going to be the sum of these three. Because for every, uh, say, meter we travel upwards here, we need to pull out three meters of string up here. Because we have these three kind of sections here. So that means for every second that we move one meter up here, we move three meters up here. So the velocity up here will be three times the velocity down here. So we can say that our velocity is 1.5. So that's 0 0.5 times three. And that is equal to omega times d over two. And we know d. Uh, so we can just rearrange this for omega, which will be 60 radians per second. Okay, and then finally, it's asking, uh, what is the force F with which the motor is pulling? So um, an important uh, equation that we need to know here is that power is force times velocity. And we know the power of the motor. Uh, we worked that out earlier, it's 500 watts. We know the velocity, um, that the, mo the motor is pulling with um, as 1.5. And we don't know this force here. So all we need to do is rearrange for this force and we get 333 newtons. So our final topic, we've covered this a lot and just kind of assumed this knowledge through many other, other questions, uh, but the principle of conservation of energy and the principle of conservation of momentum. So I'm sure you all already know we've used this principle in so many of our questions that um, energy and momentum can't be created or destroyed. We have a kind of set blob of energy in the beginning of our system, uh, and then it's kind of converted within the system to get kind of like several little blobs on this side that still add up to that blob of energy that we had in the start. Um, so this is actually uh, the same question that we saw earlier when we spoke about SUVATs uh, and it's asking about the car traveling along and it sees a cat and it needs to break. Um, and the question was a little bit complicated when we tried to answer it using SUVATs, but it is so much simpler when we try and answer it using energy methods instead. So instead, what we can say is that we can say that um, our work done in braking is equal to the kinetic energy that we lose when we break. So the kinetic energy that we had in the beginning was half um, mu squared. And then our work done will be force times distance. We know the distance it'll travel, so we can just rearrange um, that to get the force. And then finally, um, we have just a slightly different example of a non-rotating ball of mass two uh, kilograms sliding on a smooth frictionless horizontal surface at speed one meter per second. And it collides elastically and head on with a stationary ball of mass one kilogram. Uh, what are the speeds of the two balls after the collision? So when we say that it collides elastically, what we're saying is that it doesn't lose any energy during the collision. 
So here's just a little uh, diagram of what's happening. We have this large mass and it bumps into this small mass, um, and which is still. And then they both leave with some kind of velocity. So we want to use the principle of conservation of momentum for this first part. So we can say, well, we have a mass of two and a velocity of one. So that's the momentum of our large ball here. And then our second ball has a mass of one, but it is still. So our, we have no momentum in the second ball. And then um, after the collision, we should have the same total momentum, right? So we have this mass of two multiplied by some unknown velocity, and then this mass of one multiplied by another unknown velocity for the momentum of the momentum of the two balls after collision. So that is one equation. We have two equals two v one plus v two. And then the next thing we can use is we can use the principle of conservation of energy to say that. Um, no energy is lost, so the kinetic energy from the beginning is completely converted to kinetic energy in the end. Uh, so we can say that the kinetic energy of ball, the two kilogram ball is this, um, and then this second ball had no kinetic energy, so that's just zero. And then the kinetic energy afterwards would be half m, so two for the first ball, v1 squared. Um, and then the kinetic energy of the second ball would be half m, which is one times v2 squared. So then we have two equations that relate two velocities. So we have enough information to work out both of them. So we can rearrange this equation here to get an expression for v1 in terms of v2. And then we can pop that back into our equation up here, which for some reason I called two. I've called this one one. I'm not really sure why. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we've popped one into two. Uh, so we've replaced that V1 with this here. And then we can just rearrange that to get um, a essentially a quadratic equation. But one said that V2 is zero, so that would be as if we had missed, um, <laughs> we didn't hit the second ball at all. So that can't be the case. And then the second two, we've got four over three meters per second. And then we can use this uh, solution that we got for V2 to pop back into our equation for V1 to get a numerical value of a third. So that completes my video on mechanics. Um, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, and like I said, some of the more tricky questions, I will try and go over them in full in a video specifically dedicated to tricky questions and I will try and slow down um, for those ones and explain as clearly as I can uh, the steps for those questions. Um, but I hope to see you in the next video where I'll be talking about waves and optics.